So three, two, one, and of course I get an alert. All right, so we are live. We're going to have to wait for people to show up because there's a lot of lag here. We can't see stuff in real time. All right, time. let me type that down. Hey, the ASP.NET community stand-up is live now live. at... Live at ASP.NET. Web, 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 live. Okay. Boop. Tweeted. And, oh, of course, I didn't have TweetDeck open, so let me wait for the world to refresh. And Amazon then I HQ retweet. thing? What's that? Does Amazon pick their HQ? Well, yeah, I heard it's it's a split between New York and some other place. And uh, like, it's not New York; it's Long Island City. Well, they renamed it to something Landing or something. I don't know, but it's <laughs> down the street from Maria's house. Okay, she can like see it from her. Is that not door. in New York? Uh, no, it's in Long Island City. Is that not in the state of New York? It is in this very large state of New York. There you go. There you go. All right. Did I? Point is though, that it's, that? it's like yeah. Lower Queens. Okay. And it's another a, place, right? No one's talking about the other place, wasn't it? Too, uh, Crystal City, okay. which is funny because it that like between Long Island City and Crystal City, it sounds like like two fake city names from The Flash. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're not going to be in Star City. Yeah. So I want to say hello to everyone. We do have people here now. Um, apologies for the delays. We are still fighting audio gremlins in this studio, and we spent the last <clears throat> fifteen minutes trying to get things going. We do think we have narrowed it down to a source, but we do not have a solution yet. So if my audio goes quiet during the show, I apologize. We are working very hard. Uh, current, the, the theory points to um, Windows self-leveling audio whenever the guests on the Teams or Skype or Hangouts call, it doesn't seem to matter what we use. Someone goes, oh, someone's trying to talk through a communications channel, and then it mute and it, like it drastically lowers the volume. So we've tried to turn everything off. We have threads with product PM manager engineers from all the various teams, and we're trying to really figure this out because we'd like to just to have it work when we walk in. But we do appreciate people uh, listening to us anyway. Um, Scott, we haven't seen you in a while. I have been in South Africa. How did that go? Um, it was good. Um, I survived. It was um, that's a, not, that's a pretty low bar. <laughs> it is kind of a, it is a little bit of a low bar. Lots of uh, lots of wedding stuff. Three weeks of three weeks of South Africa, man. I mean, you have to drive on the wrong side of the road, which is a thing. Um, <laughs> the internet is slower. Oh yeah, that I can yeah I can buy a see. lot. Yeah, it's the first time that I've been there and had internet though. Which Did you unplug good. though? Did you like consciously? I haven't heard I from you. I didn't unplug. I think Hunter teased me about this, but I need people to understand that I feel better occasionally deleting email. Mm. You know what I mean? Like everyone's like, oh, it's such a great thing. I unplugged. There is value in me being plugged in for a minute. I enjoy a little bit of a little news, occasional podcast, deleting a little bit of email. Mm. Um, I pre-recorded podcast episodes. Okay. And had my editor release them. So I had podcasts coming out every Thursday. That's cool. I pre recorded them all, did everything ahead of time. So I literally did nothing. But I still wrote two blog posts a week. But I didn't feel overly connected. Mm -hmm. It was good. It was healthy. I forgot my password, which was good. That, okay. That, that, that's pretty unconnected then. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good uh, sign, I think, that you're. Uh... That you are somewhat disconnected if you forgot yeah, your password. Yeah, like had to do a reset of my password, which was good. That is good. Um, but yeah, you know, it was cool. It was cool. Well, I uh, I just the part is that's hard is getting interested in work again. Yeah, so we've talked about this. I think after every vacation either one of us takes, <laughs> it's like you come back and you go, oh, that's right. I have to go to work and like think about things and send emails and stuff in order to like keep paying my bills. Um, why can't I just be on a beach or why can't I be traveling the world or playing Nintendo or something all the time? Why is that not how this works? Mm -hmm. oh, well, never mind. I just, you know, like I talked to Hunter, my boss, yeah. your boss, and I said, I'm just trying to care again. You know what I mean? It takes a I, bit. I, I wasn't checking Reddit. I wasn't thinking about the community. Yep. Even though I love y'all, I was chilling. Well, that's it. Oh, that's good. So you I went to Nando's out. like four times. Oh, nice. now I'm super jealous. So when we're in London in January, we have to go to Nando's, okay? The thing that's funny about Nando's is that people don't appreciate Nando's who have it. They're like, oh, that place is trash. Like, no, it's actually quite nice. Like, 
name a place where I can get an actual chicken breast sandwich in America. Like, it's all crap chicken. Exactly. Like, Nando's is lovely. You all don't appreciate your Nando's. <laughs> Especially if you like spicy. But you can, you can get it any level that you like. All right. Um, someone is asking what's up with my hand. So, yes, I have a brace on my hand for the people who have, um, or a splint, I should say, on oh, my hand for those who have. I can't see that. Um, I woke up in terrible pain. No, no, I didn't wake up in pain. I was playing. It's actually quite depressing. So I'm 40. And <gasps> yes. And Sorry. I, <laughs> I was playing. I played, like I said, it was Friday. It was Thursday night last week. I was playing chess with my son, Fitzwilliam. And then uh, we decided to play a game of, uh, oh, what's that game? We learned it in summer this year. It's a, it's a card game. It's like a cross between Snap and like 40 other games. Anyway, so I think at one point I had slapped my hand down the pile in a futile attempt to beat him at a card game. And I, it just started hurting. And I don't know, I, I, like it just started hurting. It was like, oh, this is kind of sore now. And as I kept playing cards, it got sore and sore. And then as the night went on, it got to the point where like I was, whenever it would tweak, I would have to sit down. It was so painful. Um, like I had broken my wrist, like majorly somehow. And so I didn't sleep well that night. And then I went to the hospital in the morning and got x-rays and all that type of stuff. Nothing's broken. Um, and so they say it is, uh, they could see arthritis in my hand. I did break this thumb very badly about 13 years ago in a karate uh, incident. Um, so they think it's tendonitis. And so the treatment for that is Tylenol and a wrist brace or wrist splint just to try and keep it in one position for a while. Um, so anyway, that's what it is. And so I'm going to see how this goes for a couple of weeks and hopefully uh, it you know, goes, gets better or something. I don't know. But thank you. I appreciate the concern. Um, I'm sorry, the peeps, but there's, there's debates going on about the audio as usual. Do, the audio sounds fine. Like I'm literally on the, on the, the public one, the YouTube listening. Yeah. Um, I'll try muting myself, but it's it would be local audio, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's odd that I wouldn't hear it because I'm here. I'm actually monitoring like the, the headphone I have here is in theory You're hearing yourself monitoring your what OBS is sending to YouTube, and yep. I hear myself. Yeah, I, I absolutely have. So I'm in theory can hear everything. Um, John is saying the sound is better now, so and audio is better. Well. Cross things. It's going up and down. Like we said, we, we, we haven't solved that issue. So it will go up and down. Um, but and Greg says it's the best ever. <laughs> if <we're, laughs> This is like asking our customers what features they want us to build. Um, you can never get you know, the same answer twice. So on that note, we don't have John this week. John is traveling. He's away somewhere. You're his boss. Do you know where John is? John, I'm muting myself to see if I can improve the echo. Oh, okay. Um, John is in Sofia, Bulgaria. Okay. At a conference, I hope? Or, no, or... just hanging out. Just hanging? Yes. <laughs> cool. All right. And I'll, and, and uh, you, had, you had sent out some kind of a note about, while well, I was gone, about? changing everything with the stand-up. Oh, no, we haven't. Yeah, we can just, show up more we can, often. We can talk going, about that today. Getting, We've been meaning to chat about it on here. the show, and I haven't yet. I have feelings about it, so I'm happy to talk about it publicly. I don't hide. Like, I, I'm kind of, I'm very two-minded about it, but I'm very happy. I, I'm taking on feedback from other people, and I've asked the community what their thoughts are, and as expected, we got two types of feedback. One was quite more dominant than the other, but we'll chat about it. Okay. Um, but other things that happened while you were away, obviously, we were you here when we did preview three, the last preview of two two. I think you were. We are you? No, you weren't. I don't, I don't you did a think blog post. so. You did a blog post. You did a blog post. You yeah, updated. Yeah, I, I think I did a blog post where I upgraded. Actually, let me look at that. I did an up, I did a blog post a couple of weeks ago. Late day, no, we could we can half book ago, where I upgraded to. to yeah, there it is. Uh, on the sixth. Sweet. I upgraded from 2.2 two to 2.2 two, two preview 3. Right. And uh, it was surprisingly easy. Frankly, the only thing that was a challenge was when I went into Azure and hit into the into the extensions yep. for, for Azure website and I hit update. Yes. The first time I got an error saying it couldn't update it while it was in use. Oh, interesting. And then I hit update again and it worked. And it worked. Okay. Which was a little weird. Okay. If in doubt, try again, I guess. Yeah, but you know, I mean, flakies are always 
confusing. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, I think the, the extension stuff on uh, Azure uh, app site, what's it called? Azure App Service, web apps, Azure websites, Azure App Service. What's the full yeah. name? That thing. I always call it Interis, and no one else knows what that is. Um, yeah, it, it can time out. So we've had some issues where if the extension is quite large, it can actually time out during the install. Um, and the other one you mentioned, which is sometimes it decides it can't overwrite a file or something because something's in use. So um, yeah, just trying again is usually the, the best remedy. But yeah, I was actually happy to see your blog post was very much, I just do what I normally do. I ran my favorite open source tool to determine what needed updating. I, mm. I liked that you called out to the docs to talk about why the meta package shouldn't have a version because we had discussed that on a previous show. I still uh, feel that that's a little bit confusing. No, it is confusing. We acknowledged it, like open completely that it was confusing and that it was being redesigned in 3.0 to hopefully make it less confusing. Yeah. Um, you know, we, you know, uh, I, we, we discussed this on a previous show, right? We went through a whole history of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a reason why it is why it is the way it is. Well, and ultimately when the things, like the thing that made, if you look, take a look at my blog post, yeah, I'm looking at it in the comments there, uh, the thing that made it easy was two things. Yep. .NET outdated yes. as a global tool right. is just freaking genius as our new keeper and Dependabot and all yep. of these genius things. And then B, knowing that the framework version should not have a version that should be versionless. Right. It's that B that is the challenge, like so knowing that. After we talked about this last time, I thought someone ended up sending a PR or opening an to, issue. To New Keeper. Ah, but, but not all of the .NET not outdated. Okay. outdated things have been have been updated like that. OK, OK. Um, but I wanted to show you, I think I showed you this. Let me share my screen. Is that, is that, am I allowed to do that? Yes, of course you can. Uh, tell me if you can see this. I can see your face your avatar, and then I'm assuming your screen will pop up. There it is. OK. So you see this here? Yep. Look, Dependabot, I love this thing. This is the thing you host yourself, request. right? Right, so this yep. is my uh, my repo for Hansel Minutes, the podcast. And I've got all these closed pull requests. Mm -hmm. So for example, I got a pull request from a bot that said, hey, you know, you need to update this extension. And then right. lo look at this. It leaves a comment later saying, oh, well, you got around to that or somehow it fixed it. And then it actually closes and deletes the branch. Oh, that's very cool. Where do you In host that? Genius. Where do you host it? Uh, it's hosted for you. Oh, Depend I thought you had to host bot. it yourself. No, no. So there's, there's different bots out there. So Dependabot is a, is a thing. Okay. And, and you, it'll support lots of different languages. .NET is in beta. Do you have to pay for it? Uh, these are the languages, okay. and the pricing, uh, I haven't paid yet. Open, oh, open source, source accounts free. are free. Oh, wow. Oh, yes. Yes. Now, New Keeper, N-U Keeper, right. is another that, um, that, that you can host yourself. And then .NET Outdated is when you can do it the command line. So it's cool because it actually like feels like you're talking to a person. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Now mm. check this out. It also is really smart about what it adds to the comments. You see this here? Yep. So I've got a link to the compare view, right? It sends you off to where the actual thing happened. So if I open this up, like, let me go to another PR. Let's look at a closed one. Uh, here we go. Mark dig got updated, right? Right. Look, they dug out the change log. Oh, wow. Wait, how did they do that? So they figured out where Mark Dig is in NuGet, followed it back to its GitHub, huh? mapped the version to its change log, and then dropped the change log into the comment mean? about why Sorry, you should do Sorry, but like change log isn't a Git thing. Do you mean like the GitHub releases or the tags or like how are they? Changelog.md. Oh, okay. So there's enough conventional information. We don't do that. We don't have changelog.md in our. Repo. Well, you need to. Why? Wow, that's the first I've heard of it, honestly. Well, let's go figure out if it did that. So here's, look, here's the mm. ASP.NET Core app. Yeah. They don't have a changelog MD because you suck. Yeah. But they brought in the commits. And then huh. you can go over to the commits. How do folks generate their changelogs? I'm assuming there's a tool for this. I bet you there probably is. Because... Let's look at this one. So here's coverlet. There's commits. Huh. Here's skippable fact. There's commits. Here's alt cover. Here's release notes. So how do they do that? They got that from slash releases. So we do have releases. So I'm wondering why 
So the idea is that they found this number mm -hmm. in the NuGet, and then they went and found it in one of the X places. So hang on. Sorry, I'd like to really understand the bouncing balls here, like how they get from one node to the next. So obviously there's NuGet, that makes sense. In NuGet, there is, in the package, there is metadata that points to the GitHub repo. Is that what they're it's looking at? I'm guessing. Because we have that data. Maybe our data is out of date. Maybe it's out so of date. So then, then if and we then... look at it, so Mark Dig was one, Coverlet, let's try Selenium. And then from there, they can determine if you use releases, they can match the version up with the release, which right. makes or sense. Right, or changelog.md, which is or like a, a change standard log MD. thing. How do they pick the right one? Do they go to a tag or do they go to a brand? Well, so what it appears to be doing, yeah. and, and, I, and I can only say that as a user of the thing, mm -hmm. is if it's release notes, they drop in it from this version down. Okay. They look, see this version? And then this is like a header or whatever. Yep. And it actually says sourced from right there. Right. But under change log, sourced from, this one pulled from release notes.md. That one, oh, that link did. Yeah. So change hmm. log MD, release notes MD, there appear to be a heuristics. Like it's looking for That's this file dot this cool. and this file dot that. So Stuart Lang says some use git release notes for that, which must be a tool. Okay. So the point is, we should be doing that. Yeah, I totally agree. And then look at this. Yeah, commits, then they pull yeah. out the commits. Yeah, that makes total sense, right? That, that's yeah. And See again, this one here? I'm assuming that's based on the commit shards that are logged with each release in the releases tab. Of I GitHub. can only assume so. And I think that it's something that we could easily look up. And we should plug in Dependabot full, full, full first. That's pretty cool. And then we should go and learn about its heuristics. We should. But look at this, commits. So then, the best part? See this was commands and options? Yep, yep. Dude, you, you can, can talk to oh, it. Oh, that's nice. And tell it, oh, ignore this dependency or use these labelers or in the future send these bumps to reviewers. Mm, that's cool. Huh? It'll even badge you if you want. Okay? So right now, if I go back to my PRs, I've got an alt cover one. Now this compatibility thing is something that they haven't done yet. Right. But basically, if it updates from this to this for that particular one, okay. and projects pass CI, what? They will keep track of a compatibility score. Okay. Where did this come from? Who is the, who? Who are these people? This is seriously they're just, cool. They're lovely, aren't this they? Lovely. It's a company. It's like a cool. thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I talked about that. I don't know them. I have no relationship. I had no with idea them. this was as like okay. as, as featured about, as you were saying. What's clever about it is that they've thought about the idea, they thought about the thing, right? But then they actually did it. Right. Like it makes total sense. Like look at this. If we, amongst all open source projects, migrate from a a X to Y, right? And you have a CI, and that CI is badged or whatever, right. or a bot. They're going to have to go and have all the heuristics for figuring out the well, bots. Well, they get commit status, right, on Git. They, so they will then calculate a score. Right. Look, we update apps, we listen for test results, yep. and we'll tell you what percentage passes. Oh, my goodness. Which will then give you a safety right. Rating score of some sort. based on the thing. That is it's amazing. It's just genius. It's just it's offensive. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know you've really hit the mark when you offend oh, someone because yeah, they're man. so capable. So now I'll go in here. I'll, I'm just going to say this is probably fine, right? Mm -hmm. I'll bump it. I'll merge it. And uh, then you're good. I can delete their branch. And in a minute, they'll comment and they'll be like, yeah, cool, you know, or whatever. Right. That is. It's really extraordinary. Cool. Seriously, seriously cool. Someone told me on here to say, look at the actual MarkDig package. So I'm opening it in NuGet Package Explorer because he's saying that they actually link to their change Here's log. MarkDig. MarkDig. Yeah. He says that he, they actually link to their change log in their NuGet metadata. So I'm looking. I'm trying Ooh, to okay. see Okay. Well, let's look at this here. So here's MarkDig. Right. Okay. So let's go into the source. Where's the NuGet package? I'm looking at it. In, I just downloaded it, and I'm looking at it in Package Explorer. Understood. And I, I'm just suggesting that there might be a new spec here sitting somewhere. Oh, but Inter they may. They may not be right. People don't. Interestingly, use they anymore. haven't got one. So mark dig. NuGet. Uh, 
Yeah, it's typical these days, it's actually kind of a very edge case that you would need. Did I actually have a light turn off? Um, that you would need to have a new spec because all that metadata can be supplied in the CS project. Yeah, 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 yeah understood. Most of it anyway. Because of .NET Core. Wow. Okay, so .NET make CLI. directory poopy. Uh, NuGet install markdig. You're very CLI today, aren't you? I'm always CLI, baby. Okay. I Rename. Pref prefer NuGet package explorer for this type of stuff. Nope. No. Yeah. So nice. Star dot zip. Rename. St rename star dot pkg star dot zip. Hmm. Oh, NuGet package. Sorry. I'm not seeing it in the metadata here. I'm seeing obviously the Git link, which is where they. Oh no, I'm seeing it. Sorry, release notes. It's definitely there. So they have a NuGet has a release notes metadata item, and they are pointing directly at the changelog.md. It's in the new spec. It's in the new spec. Yep. Okay, so here's the new spec. It just took me a long time to see it. Release notes. Yep. Look at that. Yep, and are it goes to that, that file. So if you go to that file, no, because we don't automate creation of release notes today. It's been a headache. We've been trying, and it's just been mm. very difficult for lots of different reasons, mostly because our products are composed from lots and lots and lots of different places. Um, but that has changed recently. Like the ASP.NET stuff, at least, is now all in a single repo. Um, so in theory, this could get possible, but please don't assume that it is easy. And nothing that we do, unfortunately, is easy. Indeed. Um, that I'm using this Fluent. If you use this, yeah, the new terminal, Fluent terminal, it's lovely. Can you just that that URL that they had? The, can you just open that changelog file? I just want to go we'll go right to the end of this experience and just understand what that file looks like. Are so they if we look at the source of it, it's so, just a bunch of H3s or okay. H2s. So in the Depender bot, were they picking the heading that was relevant and only showing that, or were they showing the whole yeah, thing? Yeah. Oh wow. No, they, they showed the whole look. thing. Oh no, no they did the range, the dude. <gasps> Okay. They did the range. Okay. okay, that's pretty damn cool. Someone needs to like write all this up <laughs> as an end to end on how to do this. It's just genius because they did the work and they're dealing with unstructured or somewhat structured, lightly structured data. Right, but I mean like the, the article that shows someone who has a .NET open source library hosted on GitHub how to do this. So we have this new guidance, right, that James and folks um, submitted to our docs. Um, about you know, guidelines for open source.NET packages. And it includes details, not just about the .NET assemblies themselves and what you mm -hmm. should do. It includes other details. And, and it should be expanded to include more about best practices like this, so that the, your library is not only great to consume for people who just want to consume it as a package, but also great to experience for folks who are participating in, in it from an open source point of view. And there's just so many little things that you can do to make it better, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, here's just another one. Like you should integrate with Dependabot. You should do these things. And what's great about it is it isn't, it turns out it's not very specific. It's just that you should have a release notes thing. But how do I do that? Well, there's probably some tool you have to go and set up as part of your CI, which CI are you using? There's a whole bunch of forks in that walkthrough that should be written down. Like it should be somewhere. I'm, maybe they are. I just didn't know. I have no doubt it's all written down somewhere. But, okay. but, but, but when we talk about that, the, the goal that you had at some point, which was to make a way to say, file yes. new open source project. We do have that. It's just not released yet. Yeah, I understood. Yeah. This is something that should be included. Absolutely. Yeah. That is one like, of like many the gentleman things. who just said, or gentleman or lady who just said in the chat, blog entry on open source structure guidance for Dependabot. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what's, what's the convention? Right, exactly. And like, what are the options of the conventions? And like, the whole thing of, of getting your flows set up so that not only do you just have code in GitHub, you have CI set up on both your check-ins and PRs. You have tests that are running. You have a, a, a MyGet or, a, or at least a, a CI feed of packages so that people can get uh, uh, packages before you publish them. You have publishing to NuGet with automatic versioning that checks for some breaking changes, all those type of things. Um, you have release notes being scheduled now. You have a change log. You have releases being tagged in GitHub as GitHub release that point to those release notes. Like all, and then have your new pack and have all the correct metadata set up in your CS projects or your new specs so that all that stuff flows into NuGet so that things like Dependabot can use them correctly. All that as an end-to-end -end is not trivial. Like today, that is hours and hours and hours of work to get just that much going. But yep. in my my view, that's like 
that's hello world to get my package going. Like that's what you it's, need. It's the minimum bar. It's the minimum bar of what you it's want. It's the we've talked about yak shaving. Right. Right. Or haven't you set up your open source yeah. project yet? Right. Well, I got to shave this yak. Right. Well, exactly. I have this idea. Let me go and write some code. Oh no, I can't do that yet because yeah, I have to. Because I don't have to change logs and exactly. releases and all that stuff. Well, and if you saw, uh, so I blogged about Fluent Terminal. Yes. Right. And I blogged about these different terminals, and they're all very alpha, right? Because the terminal space in in Windows is very uh, in flux right now because they're making a move from one PTY to another. And as such, all the terminals, the con emus and the commanders and the fluent terminals and the terminus, they're all switching over to this new format. So there's this new kind of like renaissance of updated terminals for Windows, and none of them really have a good installer, right? Right. So Oren Novotny, who's just a lovely person, uh, noticed that one of them didn't have an installer, and then Paul Betts got involved, and they went off and started looking at ways to make these things easier to install. Do we make a squirrel installer? Do we make a script? Mm. What about certs? Again, nothing to do with a terminal, right. just getting stuff installed. And for, them, for those who might be listening and saying, well, this is just how Windows sucks, Oh, it sucks everywhere, right? <laughs> like, if you want to install something and it requires Homebrew right. or Python or da 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 you know, installing stuff is hard and has nothing to do with your project. So then once your thing is building, now it's 20% getting the work done and 80% making it sustainable, right. reliable, and buildable and installable. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, as folks are pointing out, yes, if it's automatable, we should do that and we should, you know, we should absolutely do that, make it available to everyone. I just... I, I, it, it irks me when people try and trivialize. You should just do this, and like oh, yeah. The, yeah. even Why don't for you my just help out for then? my Mickey Mouse like one assembly package that targets two TFMs. I still haven't done this. I haven't even published it to NuGet yet. Like I just haven't sat down and spent the what literally would be many, many, many hours to to, to do that. I got Atveya set up when I first did it. Well, I haven't. Yeah. I maintained it since. Um, and then to try and scale that to the type of product that ASP.NET Core is with oh, yeah. hundreds of packages, like it is not free. Like we have, we went through the spreadsheet. I, I mean, you weren't mm -hmm. here, but we went through the spreadsheet of how we allocate um, all of our engineers for the 3.0 release a couple of weeks ago on this show. Like yeah. we were very open about where people will be working. And we have more than a whole person whose, jo whose sole job is just making the build work, maintain mm -hmm. the build, make it do its stuff. Because you know, there are structural changes every time that we do things. And it currently doesn't include doing stuff like this. And I would hazard a guess if I went to um, those individuals and said, hey, we want to get all this stuff working. We want change logs, da, 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 and we want this nice end to end. They would go, yeah, yeah that's probably going to take me three weeks of work. So I made this stupid little manager for Windows that manages Wi-Fi. So oh, like, yeah. you know how you, uh, you go to a, a hotel, and then right. you add yourself to their Wi-Fi, and then like a couple years later, you've got a dozen Wi-Fi's that your machine is insecurely automatically attaching itself yes. to. Yes. Right. So I wrote this thing six years ago. Right. Right. It's a little command line thing, and it looks at your Wi-Fi's and removes them. Number one complaint isn't that it works or doesn't work. Right. It's I'm missing a license, or I'm missing a this, or I'm missing a that, or it's not updated in in chocolatey, or it doesn't have you know. So slowly over the years, I've added license scanning. You know, wow. like free and open source license scanning. Yep, is yep. that done? Yeah. Uh, does it build an app there? <laughs> this this thing is 38 lines of code. Yeah. And a thousand bits of administrivia. Yes. And does still doesn't have a releases or a well it has a I think it does it have releases? Nope, zero. Yeah, so I got no releases, but it's in chocolatey, mm -hmm. et, cetera, et cetera. But there's another one, right? Like if I want to actually deploy it into NuGet and update it automatically, et cetera, et cetera, yep. et cetera. And it's even then, like we, we could automate that. We could make a service that makes that you know, file new open source. You still have to learn what the conventions are. It's undoubtedly going to be built on a dozen different tools that oh, expect yeah. you to work a certain way to automate those things, whether it's on versioning or releasing or tagging or how you structure your release notes and generate your change log, la, 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 la. And if you miss one of those things, the automation breaks down. So you. It is always a cost to the maintainer to have to, you know, to do this to make it easy for you for you to consume. Of course, it is best practice. Of course, it is in the interest of everybody that you do that. But it is not cheap. It is not free. You probably saw Nick Craver's tweets over the yeah, last few yeah. days. Um, uh, you know, just expressing, you know, it's probably small lowercase f frustration with how much time it takes to maintain a, a very popular open source library. Um, like some of the ones that he does, mm -hmm. um, where they want 
they want good practice automation. They want to ensure that their tests run every time for products like OpServer. Um, and they have to spin up MySQL servers and Redis servers and goodness knows what else, cross-platform stuff. They have all that working. I think it's in App Bayer today. And folks are like, oh, you should move to Azure DevOps because it's free for open source and stuff. And they're like, well, yeah, but last time we spent 30 minutes looking at it, it seemed like it wouldn't support the things that we wanted. Mm -hmm. And I just do not have the time to go and sync, you know, probably, I don't know, 100 hours to reset up all those builds on a new, it's not click, click, go. Like maybe if you just have a bunch of unit tests that only have to run on one version of .NET, yeah, it's the, and it's all encapsulated like true unit tests. Maybe it is very simple, but as soon as you need to do integration tests and you have third-party dependencies and you have servers that have to have a lifetime that's managed, they have to be cleared out between each run, like that is a lot of automation work, especially for an open source library where no one is paying you to do it and everyone is complaining about the fact that you don't do it. <laughs> so. It was interesting. That's why community is so important in, in, in open source, right? That's why it's so important to build up a community to help you do this type of stuff. Well, and, and so many people say, well, I don't have expertise in whatever this obscure thing is, so obviously I can't get involved in open source. But people don't give credit for uh, docs, right? App, you know, DevOps. Yep. You want to help out? Do some, do some DevOps. Yep, absolutely. Now, and there's, there, there are issues there too. I think Nick even pointed out a lot of that time that requires giving the person admin access to the GitHub context. repo to set up webhooks. And, and it's like, so that can be a real barrier to get over. Like, you know, you can't just walk up and knock on the door of an open source project. Hey, I'm going to take over all your builds and I'm volunteering. And so you shouldn't say no. It's like, well, I don't know you from a loaf of bread. And <laughs> if I just give you my admin access, like goodness knows what you're going to do to, you know, it's, a, it's difficult. It takes time. You have to establish trust, um, like anything, right? Before you, before you and, do this. And things. how do you teach people how to build relationships? Well, especially through a keyboard. You know, it's, and then, which is a whole other realm not of, to mention, of problems. Not to mention if English, English isn't it's your second your language, language, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, I did want to spend some time before we go today. I did promise that we would chat briefly about the uh, changes I talked about potentially bringing to the stand-up. And we should chat very briefly about the uh, update I made to the announcement yesterday about ASP.NET Core 2.1 packages running on .NET Framework. Let's do that one first. Okay. Um, so uh, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We've had a series of announcements over the last three weeks regarding .NET Framework, uh, .NET Framework's future, the, the plans for .NET Core 3, and then some of the um, other .NET technologies that are obviously associated with .NET Core 3, like updates to the language with C Sharp. That post went out yesterday, C Sharp 8, uh, Visual, Basic, Visual, Visual Basic 16, or Visual Basic .NET 16, I think it was yesterday. Um, <laughs> Uh, .NET Standard 2.1, we had a post last week talking about uh, what's coming in .NET Standard 2.1 and how uh, that won't be applied to .NET Framework. And then there was the post before that, my post about ASP.NET Core, um, yeah, this one here that you're showing now, um, ASP.NET Core 3. And th this post was focusing on changes, not, not new features. I'm going to do another post about features. I, st I spoke about features on this show last week, and then I owed the community a post about uh, you know, detailing what we know about those features right now because the team has actually started working on them. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the announcement there, there's the update that I posted yesterday, which was based on feedback that we received um, from a few folks, uh, quite a few folks in the community. Uh, they would like to have somewhere to land where they can use ASP.NET Core on a runtime that is supported longer term than the .NET Core LTS policy. So .NET Core LTS is three years. 2.1 is the current LTS. It went to it went LTS in August this year, so it will be supported and serviced to at least August 2021, which is three years out. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, ASP.NET Core 2.1 uh, is tied up in that uh, support policy, and so it was going to end of life at that point, and then folks would have to move to uh, 3.0, but that would be a problem if they weren't ready to move off .NET Framework. So we've announced a change to the policy, which is we're going to treat the ASP.NET Core 2.1 packages, mm -hmm. um, because that's how you use them when they're on .NET Framework. They're just packages, right? There's no shared frameworks or runtime stores or any .NET Core fancy things. They're just packages. They get shipped inside your application. Uh, we're going to add them to the support policy that we have for the other package-based ASP.NET frameworks. So MVC 5.x, SignalR 2.x, Web API. Uh, 2.x, that's the link that you're showing there, which mm -hmm. is the ASP.NET support lifecycle policy, which has clear details there about end of life for the previous versions, um, how we treat these packages. And if, if folks don't know, I, I, I added those links on purpose, obviously, obviously, so folks can go and understand mm -hmm. how those are supported. Um, and they're effective, you know, there is no end time put on that support policy. That policy has been n minus one 
for quite a while, which is you know, we support the latest version and the version behind it. Um, so I think we've announced the end of life for uh, MVC 4 and Web API 1 and Signaler 1. I believe it was on that uh, page you were just looking at. I think it's June next year. Mm -hmm. um, which means that the minus one will become MVC 5 and Web API 2 and Signaler 2. And then the N will become the ASP.NET Core 2.1 packages. Does that make sense? Because they're the package-based frameworks and they will run on .NET Framework. Mm -hmm. And so that effectively means they're supported indefinitely. Like there is no end date attached to that. It's just they're part of the N minus one policy. So if I can paraphrase and understand, tell me if I get this right. Okay. So then ASP.NET Core 2.1 is baked enough that it will be supported for, like you said, indefinitely. Right. Beyond three years. So if on, you're sitting on around .NET, on .NET Framework. On the .NET full when framework. When you run them on .NET Framework. Okay, so let me let me see if I understand then. So there's a group of people out there who are saying, you know, I, I run on .NET Full Framework. I like Full Framework because it's been supported for 20 years and it will be supported for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I want a web framework that can sit on it. Yep. I'm not going to have this slow-moving, reliable thing, the .NET Framework that I've counted on that runs my freaking business, yep. and then put some web framework on top that I want, that, that I have to update in a year or two or three. Sure. Yep. I want to put it live and have it work for five years or six years. Right. Well, it's more than work, right? I mean, because obviously it'll well, not keep work. Working. It'll work forever, but it'll be but supported and supported and indefinitely. Yes. So, so it's a, super a LTS, security... LTS plus plus. Right, which is what we've run the package-based frameworks under for a while, in the sense that you know they don't get new features. We haven't added features to MVC five or Signal two, um, but we 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 do do security fixes and stability fixes. Sure, for them, right? sure. And so that it is that type of support. And so the, okay. the it was typically the the biggest thing was that folks wanted a place to as a stepping stone to migrate to. So the move from you know a system web-based ASP.NET application to an ASP.NET Core on .NET Core application is basically a rewrite, right? That's a really big jump. Um, so that the middle the middle stepping stone of ASP.NET Core on .NET Framework at least gives folks a place to target um, if they still have dependencies that are very window centric or um, you know tied to .NET Framework for some reason. Now, as we've as we've said, like you know, as we've gone through .NET Core. Um, and added new APIs, it's gotten a lot easier. There are a lot more APIs available on .NET Core now than there were in the first version, um, thanks to .NET Standard 2, thanks to the Windows Compatibility Pack, which adds like, I don't know, 20,000 more APIs or something. And sure. .NET Core 3 is adding more because we're bringing WinForms and WPF and all the underlying infrastructure that supports that and more APIs because it turns out lots of WinForms apps and lots of WPF apps, because they run on Windows, depend on more of .NET Framework. And so we are bringing more of those APIs either into the Windows Compatibility Pack or into .NET Core 3 itself. So .NET Core 3 will be the most sort of API compatible version of .NET Core with .NET Framework so far, but that's little um, comfort to folks who are like, yeah, but I'm on ASP.NET Core. I need to keep running on .NET Framework because these APIs aren't here. And right. it may not be that you're using them directly. It's because you have an ancient third-party dependency that drives some piece of hardware that you have in a factory. You know, we've so, heard all types of things, and that needs these, these APIs. So. so someone in the in the chat here is saying, well, but this, you know, th I'm fine rewriting my apps if all APIs will be available. But but not every API could ever be available, right? Like That's it'll right. never be 100%. It'll approach 90 something and it'll stop. Well, I wouldn't even put a number on it. Like I don't like him saying it'll approach 90. It'll it'll approach something. And I see. you know, we've only had two versions, so like I don't want to uh, correlate, you know, try and extrapolate a history out of that. But we can certainly say there are more coming in each version, but it'll it'll flatten out at some point. There are APIs that are simply subsystems of .NET framework that have so little um, use or are just old. They're just not really um, designed in a way that we want to have them in the modern framework because they yeah, tie well, us I'm into certain do things. Yeah, I'm not going to com plus transaction manager work in .NET Core 3.0. Well, you might not, but a lot of our customers who want to port their WinForms apps to .NET Core 3 will, and that's why com is coming in .NET Core 3. Seriously? Yes, com plus activation will be in .NET Core 3 because it's required. That's how WPF works. Like A lot of the stuff uh -huh. under the covers works that way. Um, and so this is us, again, balancing how do we innovate Mm -hmm. and, and, and try and make things, you know, bring new value for new workloads and new scenarios as customers want them, while not completely abandoning the, as you said, nearly 20 year history and longer if you include all of Windows, because mm -hmm. you know, Windows is kind of the thing that has just worked forever, practically with, with everything, right? They, they treat backwards compatibility very, very 
seriously. And obviously, we do for .NET Framework as well, which is why a lot of these changes um, have happened. So mm -hmm. you can't do the things inside .NET Framework because it just breaks too many applications. It's on one and a half billion machines. That's a billion with a B. Um, and so we're moving functionality over to .NET Core based on customer demand. Mm -hmm. And you know, strategic alignment with where we want the framework to go, obviously, um, and we will continue to monitor those, monitor those things. And so, again, we've made this a policy announcement so that folks can feel a little more comfortable if they still plan to move to .NET Core, um, but they feel like they need that stepping stone. Or, like you said, there are scenarios where they want to run on an underlying framework and a web framework that they know will be serviced for a lot longer than the three-year LTS policy that is part of the .NET Core uh, uh, family of products. So, mm -hmm. so there's that. Uh, the other thing I want to chat about briefly was the tweets I put out a couple of weeks ago about potentially uh, making some changes to the community standup. So mm -hmm. I, we did get some feedback uh, from some other folks internally that they would like to be able to. So we've seen this show's format copied by a few other teams um, over the last four years. And the .NET community is obviously larger than just ASP.NET. There are other .NET shows. There is on.NET, um, there's Visual Studio Toolbox, there's uh, a bunch of Twitch live, you know, Jeff's t uh, Twitch uh, live coding show. Um, uh, James Montemagno has one as well that's focused more on Xamarin. And, but they are different shows with different formats. Okay? Mm -hmm. and so I am, you know, personally, I am sort of open to having this format be expanded to support other workloads and other shows. I have no problem with that. The one thing I am a little scared of is having broadening the scope of the show in terms of the workloads, but then have somehow it not be the same show. So like you know, you get other people in and they call it the community stand up, but they're not really doing community stand up things. They're not highlighting the community links like John does every week. They're not giving the community updates on what we're doing on yeah, the product. They're different. they're different. Like so the format of this show is the way it is because this is what I wanted it to be. And because you and I and John have been running this show for three years, it's very much you know, sort of molded itself around how we like to interact and the type of community engagement we want to do. And I would right. like that to be preserved. And I did get that feedback from folks when I stuck that out uh, in the community. So the current sort of straw man idea is that we kind of overall rebrand this thing as just the .NET community stand up. We would continue to have the same number of shows on ASP.NET. And so we would still do our thing of Tuesdays alternating morning and afternoon our time with the same hosts for doing ASP.NET community uh, content. But then for other branches of .NET, whether it's desktop development or Xamarin development or ML.NET, whatever it might be, we would have a second show each week. This is the straw man right now. We can obviously modify this. A second show. And then we would have to determine what the who the hosts are, whether it's one of us plus someone from that side or whether it's just them and not us at all. Um, and then we would rotate those other workloads through uh, this other, the other show. That, mm -hmm. was, that was the initial proposal. Some folks said that would be too many shows. I can't watch them all, which of course is, well, you don't have to watch them all. If you're only interested in ASP.NET, just do ASP.NET. Um, some folks were concerned that it would dilute the amount of ASP.NET content. And so, so I was like, no, the idea was that we would still have the one show a week like we do right now because we feel there's enough content to do that. We would bring mm -hmm. in guests and do the team thing like we've been doing, which people like. We'd have the occasional code demos, but the focus of the show is very much showcase the community um, contributions that we've seen in the last week and talk to the community about announcements that we've made, directions that we're thinking about. It, it, it's, a, it's a communication channel, right? It's not a demo show. There are other shows like on.NET and the live coding shows which are much more about that. As I said, occasionally we do demos on here and they're great, but it's much more about the other thing. Um, okay. So that's the idea. I, 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 you know, we, we could probably, I don't know how much want to have this argument in public. I have to go meet yeah. my finance guy. Okay. Um, I, my biggest concern isn't about are there too many shows or not too many shows, but I would say this. Given as someone who has done 500 episodes of Azure Friday and 700 episodes of Hansel Minutes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's sustainability is most important. Right. Can we, if it's one show a week or two shows a week, whatever, but we need to not miss shows and trans and move shows. Um, two feels like too much, but but I like the idea of broadening it, and it could be a demo, you know, a demo this week and guests that week. We could add a little structure. Mm. Second Thursday, second Tuesday of every month is demos. Third Tuesday is announcements. You know, really add structure. So the, that uh, might the solve the so problem. the the, the, the thing I would challenge you with there is we have attempted amongst the three of us. We have said that very thing many 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 times over, and I think we have proven that the three of us are incapable of doing that, or that we're not prepared to put the time in behind the scenes to make that a reality. 
because um, it takes time. It is not free, right? That takes someone yeah, you can't more than an hour. That is hours a week to make sure it's run that well. Um, yeah, whereas the structure of the show right now allows us the luxury of being somewhat ad hoc. Well, it's we can, the morning zoo, right? Yeah, now. we can walk out, and, and you know, to our, you know, in our defense, it's worked pretty well, um, and you know, for whatever reason. But yeah. I am not against that. We would simply need to find someone who owns that and loves it and nurtures it, and that is part of their job to ensure that. People are scheduled, people turn up on time, all the technical difficulties are solved, well, and it got, just happens. I've got a new employee, let's have that conversation, okay. and maybe we can do pull something off. So I'm seeing a lot of people saying, we just want a Blazer stand-up. Can we just do a version of the show that's just Blazer everywhere? Yeah, you can't do that because then the Blazer won't be the new hotness. It'll be Blazer++ plus plus or something like that, you know what I mean? There's always, new, there's always some new thing. <laughs> all right, I gotta go. All right, mate. Um, so I don't know if that means if I hang up, you go away. I guess it doesn't mean anything, does it? Well, I think it's no point me staying around without you because, you know, it's just, <laughs> if it's just me, then it's All not. right, I am late. All right, I'll mate. catch you later. Good to talk to you. Bye, Bye everybody. Master.